have this saying in her family is like, if you can't remember that recipe and you call, they won't tell you. They will say to you, I think it's time for you to come home. I am Tony Tipton Martin. I am editor in chief of Cook's Country Magazine by America's Test Kitchen. And I'm also a two times James Beard Award winner for my books on African American cooking, The Jemima Code, and Jubilee. And you can find more information on my website at tonytiptonmartin.com. My name is Adrienne Lipscomb. I am a chef and owner of Uptown Bakery in La Crosse, Wisconsin. My background is architecture and city planning and also a chef and, and pastry chef. Uh, you can find more information on me on uptowncafe.com or on Instagram at 80 Eats. Being a baker, you know, it wasn't my profession. So I didn't go to school for baking. I went to school for architecture. And I, you know, when I was doing at my same time, I was doing my PhD work in city planning. So baking was something that I fell in love with, or I have just known my entire life uh, because of my own family. Uh, my grandmother came from eight, and mainly six of them were girls. So they all learned how to cook and bake. To, to some being professionals and going to culinary school, pastry school, and becoming like master florist and uh, making wedding cakes for over 30 years. You wow. know, in my grandmother, she was the church cookbook editor. So, you know, she demanded that all her sisters give a recipe for each cookbook that she edited. And so um, it just has always been part of my life. You know, I remember making my first cookie with my mom and, and it was always a family affair. So um, it was never that that point where, OK, we're just going to make a cake for a celebration. It was about being together um, mm -hmm. and it was about cooking together and eating together. So, I, I, you know, in fact, every time it was a celebration, even though there wasn't a reason to. Um, so it just was second nature. So baking became more of a second nature to me. So when people say, oh, I don't bake because it's a science, I kind of laugh at that because it was just, you know, it's just something that I just, you know, it didn't fall into me, but we, it just became natural to be a part of my life. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And mine as well. And, and, but also historically, right? I mean, every African American female cook mostly um, is known for her, her bread in addition to her, her sweets, right? Hot roll. Right there in Texas, we have Lucille Bishop Smith and the hot roll mix uh, story. that is so important for us to know that we had people that were creating not only wonderful baked goods at home or within the community through the church, um, but also in their businesses and totally erased. Like we just didn't know anything about them. And so I think what was also exciting to me about you and the entrepreneurship that you bring to the conversation um, is just, you know, that, that fine tuning, that fine focus on the fact that, that baking is a means to economic independence for our women. The baking tradition goes back a very long way in our history, and we have tended not to uh, nurture that at all. You know, and still, is, you know, I really think, especially for Black bakers, there's there's you know, it's, I keep saying there's a lot of us, but there's not a lot of us when you look at it, look at uh, the realm of the nation, how many black bakers there are. And um, also just on the fact of who owns their own business in baking, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, to me, a lot of people are are they're baking for other businesses, but they don't get the opportunity to be that entrepreneur or have that startup opportunity to do baking. But we've been entrepreneurs for such a long time, you know, baking, baking at our house, selling from our house, selling um, to restaurants from our house. You know, there's always, there always been just to me historically um, opportunities for especially black female bakers or bakers to be able to sell their goods from their house. And I think, um, having things like the cottage law in Texas. Now 
that's how I started mine was that we were able to bake from home and be able to sell goods. And, um, and I think, I think that was just, has always just been kind of natural that we, you know, people make cakes and sold cakes or gave cakes away. Um, and so I think those kind of laws kind of opened the door uh, a little bit more for people to be, to be able to do their startup business, to be able to launch off. So that's how I was able to uh, take off in um, baking and, and accrue some money to, to start something bigger and to start doing wholesale. Yeah, I had that thought for about 30 seconds uh, that I would become a, a entrepreneur in the baking realm. And just at about the time I was thinking about reentering the food industry um, because I took off for so many years to raise my family uh, while I was living there in Austin. Um, but I spent a, a holiday season baking for people. And so I made Thanksgiving pies and uh, chose two cakes to make for Christmas. One of them was Melinda Russell's um, lemon cake that I have in my book, Jubilee. And the other one was a, a devil food, a, a um, dark chocolate pound cake, because I needed them to be able to be shippable. Mm -hmm. Right. And but that experience taught me so much about um, who we are, who we've been, who we have the potential to be. Um, just the amount of no business knowledge in it, separate from the baking knowledge that, that is imparted, um, when you create your own business and having to know, to manage your inventory and, you know, ordering and what's your sales pitch and why would anybody buy these from me when they can go over to the grocery store and buy them, um, I, I had that experience and I have so much respect for for the industry because it was, there was a lot, you know, that went into trying to perfect the just right recipe that you can duplicate, like coming up with a, a pie crust that you can uh, multiply and uh, make in quantity. Right. You yep. know, everybody thinks, Oh, I have a great recipe for sweet potato pie. I should just start a business and then not realize that when you start um, ramping up, there are so many other things to consider. So that my list of reasons, for respect for bakers is, is uh, long. My family, we've been bakers, bread and in sweets. And um, our recipes were never written down. They were always told orally. So you were watching and you saw the folding. You saw how much salt went into something, how much sugar, how much yeast. And and by palming it or handing it, um, you know, we have this saying in her family is like, if you can't remember that recipe and you call, they won't tell you. They will say to you, I think it's time for you to come home because you must Absolutely. And so, <laughs> Uh, you know, you kind of just grit your teeth and, you know, and you realize you haven't been home. But, you know, watching my, you know, my Nana or certain family members make bread and understand that technique, because, you know, people always ask me, well, how do you make your biscuits like that? And I'm like, I said, I, I tell them necessarily, it's not necessarily the recipe. It has a lot to do with the technique of making them. And, you know, and I have to walk, you know, follow through and walk through the technique. I never really thought about that until people started asking me, but it was just second nature because of just, I watched. And this is just how I knew how to do the folding of certain breads or, or the folding of biscuits and, or even the folding of cake, you know, in, in making sure it was aerated, right? So, you know, yeah, I believe the technique and we've we've always had the technique. I Sometimes I just, like I said, it's, it's missed or um, it's not written down because we do have this thing of when rich recipes were written down. And I can tell you in my grandma's cookbook that they kind of fib a little bit about teaspoon or tablespoon. Yeah, they did, didn't they? Or, or I think that's part of their immortality. Or as you said, it's their way to get you to come over. Right. And whenever I give talks, that's how I conclude is by saying that we should save these recipes. Uh, from our family members and the way to get them is to go over and cook with them and to watch them and realize that when they start using their hands, their, their hands are their measuring tools. Mm -hmm. And there is science associated with that. I was once interviewed and asked what's the most important tool in the kitchen when I was young and not Southern. And I was, you know, a little worried about how my answer was going to be perceived. But in, in our community, the hands 
are the tool. And a woman can tell you based on how far away it is from the end of her finger back to the first line, how much of a, you know, she might not know how much of a teaspoon it is, but she knows how much it measures. Right. Right. right? And that's important. And I but mean, that doesn't mean you're cooking with your, so we, that's been portrayed as cooking with soul. Like you, there's no science in it. And that's why I've resisted that language too, a little bit. It isn't that I don't want us to claim the, the creative part of soul, um, but I want us to get the respect we deserve. And that is science because it's a measurement. It's just not a measurement you recognize. Well, you know, and I tell people it's not even just the hands, but it's always on sight and smell because I, I you know, I know when a cake is done, you know, I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, get that cake. I know when it's done or I can look at something and be like, OK, it has needs five minutes to it, you know, versus, you know, versus trying to get a toothpick right away or, you know, how much time it was on the clock. It, it'd be like, no, there's not enough time on that. And that's instinct. And that's also like with the soul, because we we know our food it, um we we know by the smell the senses that we use to um to create that food um i know when a dough is good just by touching it and be like oh man this is going to be a really good bread you know and yeah but that's you know what that's apprenticeship to me that that is definitely something you learned in another setting you would learn that on the job right if you were in culinary school and then you go and stage somewhere or whatever then you learn on the job and we're in our family's homes with our family members that are training us formally or casually, we're observing. Those are all of the same techniques, right? That we have attributed to something more lofty. And it's time for us to claim that identity, I think. Um, And and baking is one of them. And the knowledge of the ingredients is another um, dimension of what you're talking about. The reason you can know what condition you're bread dough is in because you understand humidity and how much flour to add is based on what kind of day it is and so when someone asks you to write down a recipe (laughs) it's a little iffy if you give them a precise amount right a precise measurement and then they're banking it in a non-humid environment right how can i adapt recipes or add to recipes, but still um, having the essence and also being respectful to mm-hmm. recipes that have been passed down to my family. Um, because, I, you know, my grandmother makes a certain cake, a certain pound cake, and it is very well known. You can't go over her house and it will it, it not be there. Like it is always there. You come in and you say, hi, Nana. You're not even looking at her. You're looking at the cake box to see if there's a cake in there. Right. You know, and she knows you are. And um, and over time, you know, the recipe has been passed down to all the girls and and I make my cake differently. You know, I I ended up making it off the memory of what I think or I thought the cake tasted like as a kid and how I feel like the, the flavors need to be more enhanced. So I add a little bit more here and a little bit more there. And yeah. then I, I went home and I had a piece and I was, I had a piece of her cake and I, and I looked at my mom and I said, this, there's something wrong with this cake. You know, I said it really low, you know, like really low. <laughs> right. You don't dare say it out loud. <laughs> really, really low. And my mom was like, no, and I was like, hmm. And I, I, I ate it, and I went home. And I, I kid you not, thirty minutes later, my grandmother calls me and says, "What was wrong with my cake?" And I was like, "Oh my God, my mom!" You know, <laughs> my mom. <laughs> and that was the first time my grandmother and I went over the recipe over the phone verbally, like from teaspoon to tablespoon. You know, because I, I just said, "I, there's something wrong." She's like, "There's nothing wrong with my cake." And when we came to the one discrepancy in the rest in the recipe, she said, make it. She said, make it and bring it over. So I was like, oh, I'm going to do this. And so I made it. I brought it over to her house the next day and um, she didn't eat it. You know, she didn't eat it. She waited till I left and she called me and she told me, you're right. She says, you're right. I, that over time of her making it, she must have changed it. But she says, your cake is better than mine. And she says, I am going to be happy once I leave that 
there will be somebody to make this cake. So pretty much my cousin called me two days later and said, what did you do? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, grandma's not making the cake anymore. And so I had to go over and bring the cake over for a period of time <laughs> because she stopped making the cake. But it just it, it led to me to go to realize like these recipes really do get passed down. They really do. Um, if if you cherish them so much and you learn them that they're passed down and their elders are, 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 are happy and they're, you know, yeah. they realize that their story or that story is going to continue on in the family. I mean, my kids are already talking about who gets what recipe, you know, my teenagers like, so when I leave, I get the biscuit recipe, I get the cake recipe. Exactly. And, and to me, I'm like, gosh, that's good. You know, like he knows, he knows. That is so true. We, um, our tastes change, our taste buds change. And we, it, socially, we don't give enough permission for the recipes to change with it. And we're stuck in this discussion of what is authentic and what is the traditional, absolute, formal, bottom line way. And my grandmother had a devil food cake that everybody, same thing, everybody really loved it. And when I was working for the LA Times, we did a piece on um, family recipes. So we got this handwritten recipe that she had been making. She was already passed, but my mother had the handwritten recipe. So I took it into the test kitchen and here is a professional who knows how to interpret, read between the lines. If it says mix, she knows that it meant cream, the butter and sugar, right? I mean, she could tell by the organization of the recipe as it was written, basically what the instructions should be, even though they were missing. Right. And um, she made it verbatim the way that uh, according to the instructions. And when we all stood around to taste it, it was not as I remembered it. You know, it was dense, more dense. Um, the flavor of the cocoa was so intense that it almost overtook the cake, mm. you know. And I write about this chocolate cake in both books um, because of the memories I have associated with licking the bowl and, the, you know, her beating, her beating spoons. Um, but the cake just was off, like you said. And um, I, I pestered my mother about it until she finally dug out the cookbook from which she had extracted the handwritten recipe. And um, it was the same, but it was such an old recipe that those ingredients were not the same anymore, mm. you know? And, and so... So the interpretation that would be required to make it new, it was basically a pound cake, mm -hmm. you know, but we are accustomed to these cake mix cakes, right? Right. And the taste for that, and you don't taste real dense chocolate anymore. You taste a lot of sugar. Um, and, and there is no explanation for what kind of flour and where she was regionally. And was it more higher in protein or, you know, any of those elements? Did she use cake flour? Did she use bread flour? What kind of, did she use? Well, who knows? Um, so I think the history is important, like you said. And obviously, I would think the history matters um, <laughs> so much. Um, and it's also a way for us to spin, I think, opportunities again going forward. You know, if we have these stories that we can tell, then when each of us publishes a book, your book won't be the same as my book. Right. Right. Or your baked goods and your shop aren't the same as mine. And that's the way... Um, enterprise works right the competition between us is a good thing it means that those that like my flavors will come to me and some will come to you um and we really have to do more of that i think um by encouraging more people to come into this business um in the future and to realize that we can there's enough of us that we can support everybody Your goods, I'm telling you, like I, the apple fritters in Jubilee, the entire time that I was testing that recipe, I was thinking about your apple fritters. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember making them for me when I was on the Jemima Code tour. Yeah. And just, you know, it was so amazing of you to just bring them in warm. I'm thinking you're going to bring them in like you did for Soul Summit. And I have to tell this story about Soul Summit, though I'm off track. Let me tell the Soul Summit story. I'm going to tattle on everybody that was an attendee. Okay. 
So I asked Hoover and Adrian. Hoover uh, Alexander owns a, a very famous restaurant in Austin, Hoover's Cooking, and it's sold Southern food. And I asked him and Adrian. I asked him to put together a box lunch for the attendees at Soul Summit. And uh, I wanted something sweet. And so he said, perfect. I've got the perfect person. Her name is Adrian. She's an incredible baker and she'll make something. And I don't remember if we talked about it, but apple fritters wound up in this box. <laughs> and so Hoover was manning the, the table where people were picking up their lunches. And everybody had one. And there were, I guess, extra boxes left over. And after a while, people started coming over and opening the boxes and taking the fritters out <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and leaving the, it's not a, this, this, this is no disparagement. Hoover's fried chicken is great, but these people were full. <laughs> they were trying to have the three o'clock <laughs> snack in their purse <laughs> and they came back for the, um, the fritters. And my mother was doing the reception check-in and she was cracking up. She was watching the whole thing and she said, sweetie, come here. You have to see this happening watch 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 it was so amazing and so yeah those apple fritters I could have done banana I could have done mango I could have done anything else but um that was my secret little testimony to you that I couldn't write the whole story about well I thank you I think it's what's so funny about that experience is like nobody knows the other side because um I was like gosh I'll just make a biscuit and ever and then um I think it was I was talking to you and you said no Hoover was doing that and I was like I, I don't know what to to put up against Hoover because I, I was just like I don't know what what to do and it, and um the night before um I, we were at the Carver Center and um I was talking to Hoover and and I said you know I'm gonna make this fritter and Hoover's like oh he's like you're gonna make them tonight and I said I'll be damn I'm gonna wake up early in the morning <laughs> and start like at two three o'clock in the morning. And just make like 250, it was like 250 fritters that we had to make. And um, and I remember making them and I just like said, I, sm I smelled like fritter, I smelled like <laughs> And I was just like, okay, I got to get there. <laughs> and I remember showing up with all my boxes and Hoover made two biscuits. He made the sweet potato biscuit. Uh, yeah. Chicken. He made the chicken biscuit. And I was like, I was devastated. I was like, nobody's going to eat. <laughs> This fritter because <laughs> they got these beautiful sandwiches. Nobody's gonna touch this fritter. Um, so I, you know that moment will always uh, be a part of my story and a part of my life because and it was quite amazing to see people that were just sneaking. <laughs> <laughs> they were sneaking. They were grown people. <laughs> Right. People who had paid a registration fee yeah. and you had, think they had more decorum than that. And so I don't know who all did it, but it was really funny because they were, you know, I was trying like, what are you doing? And they were like, they didn't care. They were like, they literally, I had someone tell me people won't know if they don't know, because they were like, if they get their box, they just didn't know that there was murder in there. So I he was <laughs> It was a um, a very flattering and emotional experience, but it's one that I definitely do carry. I do carry with me, and you know, and and even with that recipe, that was a change. You know, it it was it was different. It, it, I decided to to add mangoes because I did mangoes in there, and um, and. And for me, you know, I don't usually cook with mangoes. It was just it was in season. I had a lot of them, and it came out amazing. I feel up to this this point when I look at Southern recipes and the, I see the future or I feel that my future is to look at these cakes and really celebrate them, but also look at what they can be. Um, and I tested that this past holiday with the butter rum cake and I made a sweet potato butter rum cake. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was going to take off. Oh, well, first of all, I made it for myself because I was craving it because people were eating. Yeah, but you food. lit up the internet with that cake. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that cake, I I literally ate it. And you know, and you're you know, you're at home, you're baking, you're quarantined in a you know an area, and you're just like, you know, when you eat something so good, and you're like, 
you want to share it, but you don't want to share it because you, but you want other people to know about it. And that was this cake. And I was like, I'm just going to make it and I'm going to make it again because I said, this must've been a fluke. And so I made it a second time. And then I said, okay, I'm going to go drop some pieces off to people that I know. And so I sliced it. I dropped it off um, at their houses. And I said, give me the honest truth because I said, I think this cake is really damn good. I just need to know. And the response I was getting back from this cake was people came and dropped off notes at my house. People called me before I could even get out their driveway and were telling me this cake was great. And I said, you know what? I'm going to see how it sells um, nationally because I'm going to decide to go into national delivery. I did not expect it to get as big, <laughs> as big as it did. I mentioned it to my recipes team at Cook Country magazine and said there is this phenomenon happening on the internet about this cake and I have a personal connection to her and I am a fan I'm like a a super fan so I want to be really careful here because I know that when we try to recreate a tribute recipe on behalf of someone that we want to make sure that it's um respectful, right? As close to what you intended it to be as possible, but that it still conforms to American Test Kitchen, America's Test Kitchen standards and stuff like that. So um, I wasn't sure whether I should tell you or not initially, but I had them like they were ordering stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so they were ordering the red velvet cookies and sending me pictures when they, you know, got them. And we would, you know, we want to do, um, you'll, you'll be the example of a kind of story that I want to begin to have happen on the magazine, which is this idea of on the pages of the magazine and ultimately on the TV show where we're talking about ad- adapting recipes in a respectful way. You know, we have a certain thing we're looking for when we're recreating our recipes. They have to be foolproof. They have to be able to be reproduced by people under all kinds of circumstances. And so that can sometimes feel like we have, you know, for, you know, lack of a better word, we've whitewashed it, right? We've taken the recipe over. So we're trying to do this dance now, figuring out how do we pay respect to you for your recipe? How do we give a tribute and and offer readers or subscribers or followers or friends a way that they can have your recipe, whether it's in a cookbook or in a magazine or on a blog post or wherever, um, how do you still, how would we help you still feel uh, respected and appreciated and not like someone tried to steal something from you or change it when your whole storyline is that you're adapting recipes too? Yeah. And I think it's like, it's, I think it's, uh, for me, it was always about, respecting but also finding my identity in these pieces you know so sometimes you know like me I'll make the regular cake or you know and taste it and be like okay this is what I know for it to be but could it be better and then sometimes it's like no it can't be better this is this is amazing I can't get past this you know and sometimes it's like what if I decide to add this or what if I decide to back off of something and and I think that's that fine line when we when we get into about who owns recipes and uh and where do recipes um lie when it comes to copywriting and and i you know for me i am about celebrating them you know and celebrating them in in my way that still gives tributes to where i've gotten them from but also Mm. um how i decide to adapt them or just sometimes I just make up stuff because I'm just like, oh, it's like this, you know, it's like, oh, it's like a red velvet cake, but it's really not a red velvet cake, you know? So it, I, I think um, we also have to allow that space or we will get stuck into, you know, in this rut of these are, these are what these recipes are and what they'll always be. We have to allow ourselves to explore the differences. And also, like I said, be very respectful and cherish those recipes as we continue on. And, you know, like I said, some recipes are just good. You know, there's like, you, there's nothing more I'm going to get from this. Um, but sometimes you can just expand a little bit more on, on, on certain recipes and be, and just be respectful doing it. And, you know, and, and honest truth, you know, if it's about a recipe and I, and I know I had it from a friend, I tell it's from a friend, you know, like I, I'm very honest. Exactly. 
And mm-hmm. um, because my friend was honest enough to give the recipe to people. And then I'm like, well, I'm going to one up it and change it, <laughs> and change it around and, you know, and give it to them and tell them, what do you think? Um, and so I think there, there's room. I think there's a lot of room in the baking world for um, new recipes and adjustments of recipes. I just think it's just a matter of how we decide to go about it. Right. We've been really focused on the recipe development and 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 the changing of a recipe, the adapting of the recipe, um, looking less at whether we're improving it, but are, how much more accessible are we making it? Mm-hmm. Right? Does it does this involve some obscure ingredients that are not as widely available in different parts of the country? Um, we have to ask all of those questions at a nap. We have to ask all of those questions. Um, at the magazine, but the question I'm now provoking everyone to ask on top of that is to make sure that we're considering the origin story and that we are being respectful to the source. Where did you, recipes, there is no original recipe. So all recipes come from somewhere and it may have come from the back of the flower package. It might've been, you know, on the side of a box. So, um, we may not know that because grandma's recipe file, she transposed it, you know, off of that package. And we don't know. We think it was her recipe or she wrote it down from her help. Right. And then her help disappeared, uh, you know, into history. And now we don't know that the help is the one who really created that recipe. So, so I'm going to be doing my part going forward as you are to adapt recipes to keep um, cultural, um, regional recipes alive. Um, but, and, and to do that by making sure that we attribute them back to the source. Um, we're having this great conversation right now about something we thought was completely innocuous. It was just, you know, sour cream coffee cake. Everybody makes a delicious sour cream coffee cake. Um, and do you put the streusel in the middle or do you put the streusel on the top? And so I asked the recipe developers to just do some research and, you know, you do a Google search and you, you come up with all of the celebrity cook names associated with that cake. Right. And, and um, so you think only Martha and Ina and, you know, others made this cake this way. And uh, you have to do some other kind of investigating to discover that this was the lunch lady's cake, you know, or that it was attributed to a Jewish bakery in LA. Um, And so all cultures have these connections to recipes that we're talking about, and they've been adapted, they've been homogenized, they've migrated into the broader society. And um, the only way we're going to keep them alive is to claim them, like you're saying, and respect the story, tell the story. And then if you change it, you change it. Right. As I said earlier, for the magazine, it it applies to the cookbook industry as well. We've had to make sure that the recipes are as broadly appealing as possible. But the Internet has democratized publishing and changed all of that. And now um, you have your own tribe. You sold your cakes to your people and you didn't you don't need a gatekeeper. You don't need a publisher. You don't need a you don't need any of those middlemen, you know, people that served in that capacity that my generation needed, right? And that means that you can write a cookbook about whatever subject you want to, and you have a worldwide audience um, that you can appeal to. And so you have your tribe, and it raises the question for us in the mainstream media venues in, in terms of how do we contour a recipe book or a recipe story to have broad appeal, but to be as true and close to what the author intended, the creator intended, right? So so will they let these cookbooks stand as your unique way and not be looking to pigeonhole it and say, well, is this the true African-American? Is this the African-American canon? You know, I went through all those questions with Jubilee as, as, um, as leaders were trying to slot it. You know, they needed to know, where is this going to go on the shelf? This is the question. How are we marketing this? And there's so, so many other variables that go into to publishing that uh, can put restrictions on how free it used to put restrictions on how free an author or a creator or a baker could be because you were trying to sell 
to the widest group possible. But now you can sell to that wide group in your own sphere and you can stay authentic and true to yourself. And that's what's going to, I think, raise the stakes here and, and cause more conversation. Like, will you have to yield and bend in your recipe style in a way that maybe I did? Mm. And, you know, and like I said, you know, I have millions of cookbooks sitting over here on my side <laughs> and and I am I'm old fashioned. I, I like to have the book itself. You know, I don't like to go online and really look at recipes and try to scroll through the entire story to get to that certain recipe. Um, I'm I'm very much like. I want to see and feel the paper and really kind of understand. I like to go find older cookbooks that have the stains in the cookbooks because, you know, that recipe was really used and um, and and like to find secret recipes folded into uh, <laughs> recipe books. I think that's true gold when you can find those. Uh, I I like I said, I hope in the future that that continues on, that that ability to um that recipe books are being used for what they're supposed to be used for and to, um, to bake and to cook with. Um, and, and that we still adapt them. You still write pencil marks in them. You still adjust them. You still decide to, to one up it and make it better. I don't feel like me one upping a recipe is the end. I feel like it's just the, you know, the start of a beginning for somebody else to continue on and to create their own story. Um, and identify and create their own chapter of the of, of what this recipe can be. Well, you bring up a point that, you know, the older cookbooks used to have blank pages in them. Mm-hmm. Remember that, you know, and so that was actually looked upon as a positive that you would use this book as a springboard for your imagination. And then you might add other recipes or interpretations on those open pages. And we've gotten away from that. Like I said, the industry... Um, has had grown more rigid over time and tried to really confine recipe writers to a particular style or a particular theme or whatever, that, you know, whatever their agenda was. And so like you, I not only hope that recipe publishing um, continues, but that adaptation finds a safe space, right, where we can appreciate the process of adaptation and not feel like it was um, theft. Yeah. Which is still, I think, where where it is for a lot of us. It still feels that way because we've been treated unfairly historically. Um, but when we start to see our recipes on package uh, label, um, that those are the kinds of signals that we'll know uh, equity has come, you know, right. to the industry in other ways that we don't have to conform our recipes that say all orange bars are made this way. You know, these are Adrian's orange bars, and that's what you're selling. That's what you're promoting. You're not trying to promote that Adrian made the orange bar that should appeal to 9,000 million people, right? This is Adrian's bar. Make it or don't. You're printing the bag anyway. Right. Bringing up a point about especially our names on products and because that's what I knew. I knew that this was Sicily's cake, you know, when I went to the church cook, you know, I knew which aunt made what, you know, because uh, those those recipes came from them and it became their identity um, at those uh, celebrations or those get togethers that we would we would get to. And I, you know, like I said, I we don't see enough of that here um, in the mainstream of understanding uh, that that these these recipes came from somewhere. Um mm-hmm kind of magically appear and then they magically just the red velvet cake, um, you know, no, no matter the adaptation of it. But I, I fear, I feel that hopefully in the future that we will start claiming more, like you said, like cl- go ahead and claiming these identities and claiming that we made this cake and claiming that this cake is this way because of this reason and, and that history behind it. <laughs> You know, as I cook here in the Midwest, it's completely different uh, than down south because we have humidity issues, right? If it's winter time here, um, I'll make a recipe and the flour will be drier because of the storage, right? Because wherever they're storing it, it's, it's a dry, it's a drier humidity. So my recipe will never come out the same way as I used to make it in Texas. I got to add a little bit more 
milk sometimes or a little bit more butter because of this issue. And a lot of people don't recognize that. They think that they can follow the recipe to a T and not really taking any account of their environment, let alone not understanding the ingredients itself. And so <clears throat> moving here made me uh, really appreciate the ingredients, especially flour, um, because of the temperature changes and Absolutely. how, how um, and how flour how flour is stored and how I store flour and and that point of um, if it's drier and what do I need to do to adapt and change a recipe um, because like I said. If I made it down to Texas and I made it up here, it wasn't the same. And it took me a while to finally realize what exactly was was happening. And, yeah. um, and like I said, it made me great have a great appreciation of each ingredient, um, and especially um, a lot of my ingredients I get from farmers. So I get to go and talk to them and really talk to them about these ingredients and where they come from. And that was intentional, you know. In Texas, uh, I kind of fell into that. And got to know farmers here. This was intentional of really reaching out and speaking to people about these ingredients and and when to use them and to preserve them. Because in my area, I have a lot of more ingredients than I than I would in Texas. So you know, berry season in Texas is like this small, you know. And here, there's a plethora, and then there's foraging and wild things that you find, um, you know, when you walk out your door and and trying to adjust those recipes. Or especially southern recipes for Midwest um, was difficult. It took me about a year and a half to kind of adjust sure. to, sure. to fix that. And then, you know, and in making bread, because, you know, people, you know, the altitude difference, I think people also need to realize their ingredients too can make a huge adjustment to what their recipe is. Of course, as do to do the tools that they're using, you know, the instruments that you're using to beat with, mixers, you can overmix. I've made cakes by hand, for example, just um, as that to have that experience. What was what was it like for Melinda Russell in 1866 to own her own bakery without a KitchenAid mixer? Right, she was beating cakes one after another by hand. And. By the third cake, your arm is like right. giving out and it gives you an entirely different respect if we just remove ourselves from the current for a minute and look at what has been accomplished through recipe development and why recipes matter. They matter for science. They matter for business. They matter for our health. They matter for so many ways, in so many ways. And like you, I hope that um, our community begins to really benefit um, I think I'm starting to see that we are. There's a lot more entrepreneurship visible um, on social platforms where people can just go directly to the consumer as you did and and sell their product until they sell it out. And they don't have all of the overhead that, that goes with it. If you can figure out how to ship it, you know, and have it arrive um, with its integrity. Um, so I'm excited about the future. Um, especially because I think a lot of people like yourself are informing their future with the stories and the truths of the past. And people are looking for us to speak constantly about the past. And I think the time is quickly coming where we'll be able to say, I'm a, I've been informed by that, but I'm ready to talk about turning the corner and talking about tomorrow and today and what I'm doing today. Let's um, finish up by telling us what are you, everybody knows what I'm doing and next, do what I do. I'm be on TV at some point and uh, running a magazine uh, and have other books in the pipeline, including a baking book down the road. So tell us what you're, what are you up to uh, next? Are we going to be able to buy your products and are they going to have little stories on them? Uh, and, um, right now I'm doing um, a lot of reading, a lot of research, a lot of soul searching, um, and looking at um, recipes and to see what's the next phase of what we're going to be doing and shipping nationally. Again, we're, we're going to hike that up. Um, you know, my restaurant is still open up here, so we still are in business. We're doing a lot of community outreach with that. Um, I also have the Project 40 Acres, uh, the 40 Acres Project, um, and we have purchased land in South Carolina and we're in the process of purchasing land here um, in the Midwest, and which we will 
look at the, we'll be looking at kind of preserving the legacy of farming and farming stories and, um, and uh, for black farmers. So we'll be um, researching and interviewing black farmers to hold their story, but understand their craft too. So there's a lot of work in that, that we're, that we're doing. There's a lot of moving parts that's happening in that. Um, and yeah, we're just going to continue on. You know, I'm hoping to write a book. I can't even believe I'm saying that. So <laughs> hoping to, to write a book and get published and, and, uh, really talk about the process of, you know, how, how and what, and I'm, what I do when I make, when I make cakes and, and the baking process of it, you know, so that's really exciting. And the, and the stories, and the stories of why I chose these cakes and what they mean. That's terrific. Well, I uh, wish you, as you know, I wish you all the best. Um, your, your work means a lot to me as do the, I call you guys the youngsters as Natalie called us her, her chickadees. <laughs> oh. um, but I'm just so happy to see the progress that has, Sprung from that weekend that we had and that the relationships that have come from it and and really the success you know you guys are all so all of you are, have really excelled from that moment and I'm looking forward to seeing whatever happens next well I really do appreciate it thank you so much for spending time with me oh this was terrific I'm glad we were thank able to get together you.